Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. No matter where you are on this fine planet of ours, I am so glad that you took time out of your schedule to join us today. This may be the last webinar you ever watch. Why? Because our topic today is about Twitter versus zombie, or said perhaps with less excitement, mass collaboration. And we encourage you to take a bite. As part of the show, we've got two fantastic guest speakers. We strongly encourage you to grab your favorite Twitter client, sit back, enjoy the conversation, participate as you feel best. The back channel will be as good as what we're talking about live and on the air here today, folks. It, it does promise to be a fun one. So how does the show work today? It's very straightforward. We're going to ask you to listen in, to add your voice to the conversation. How do you do that? You can do it on Twitter. Just make sure anything you post references hash G-E-4-L. You see that on the bottom of your screen. Or if you're a little more old-fashioned, you can join us on the chat window as part of the service. You'll see in your control panel, which probably exists in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, a section called Questions. And by all means, go there, submit your questions, and our guest speakers will get them. And we'll take them as they come in. Quite often, we will hold back and we'll ask the uh, people who ask the questions to wait until the content is done, and then after the show is done, we'll then submit the Q&A. But uh, Jesse and Pete have strongly encouraged us to be dynamic, to go with the flow. They're going to be watching your content online on Twitter as well as on here. So this show promises to be a little bit erratic and a lot of fun. We're going to bob and weave as the conversation takes us, and we're going to talk about Twitter versus zombies. But first, let's start off with our guest speakers. First up, Jesse Stommel. Who is he? Well, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Liberal Studies and the Arts at University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research focuses on digital and hybrid pedagogies, and he's an advocate for lifelong learning and the public digital humanities. He is co-founder and director of Hybrid Pedagogy, a digital journal of learning, teaching, and technology. You can find out more about his work at www.jessestommel.com, and he can be found on Twitter, at Jessifer. His contact information is there in front of you, and uh, we're going to show it to you again as the show progresses. So if you don't see it now, stay tuned. You'll see it again. But if you're fast, at Jessifer, follow him now. And while you're doing that, let's bring up our next guest speaker. That's Pete Rorabaugh. So who is he? Well, Pete is an assistant professor of English in the English Technical Communication and Media Arts Department at Southern Polytechnic State University in Marietta, Georgia. He earned an MA in English Education, a PhD in American Literature and Rhetoric from Georgia State University. While completing a postdoctoral fellowship in digital pedagogy at Georgia Tech, Pete became interested in exploring critical uses of social media and new media composition in the classroom. His teaching is informed by the field of critical pedagogy and the work of Paulo Freire. His research on hybrid pedagogy fuses these interests and includes the study of games, digital literacies, and alternatives to traditional models of schooling and scholarship. He is fascinated by the fiction of Cormac McCarthy, the life, Malcolm X, and the constant pedagogical and aesthetic revelations of his three children. Pete and Jesse, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks a lot, Daryl. <laughs> all right, and just to give Pete his fair due, again, I love his Twitter handle. All is telling. Follow him now. You'll see their contact information again in a bit. But in the meantime, I got to ask, who wants to take this? Pete, Jesse, talk to me. What is Twitter versus Zombers? Well, I'm going to start by giving, this is Jesse, I'm going to start by giving a little context um, that led up to the game, and then Pete's going to talk a little bit about the game. Um, I'm going to give you a little two-minute version of the sort of what brought this game about. Um, Pete and I started a journal together, Hybrid Pedagogy, hybridpedagogy.com. In um, Well, we started work on it in 2011. The journal officially launched in January of 2012, so we've been running the journal for about a year and a half. And the journal really evolved out of our desire to create conversations that bridged digital pedagogy and critical pedagogy. So that bridged people thinking about empowering students and people thinking about technology and how we can use technology to empower students. And also sort of critically examining the ways that technology somehow, sometimes disempowers us and our students. 
Um, and so the real goal for us was to not talk about tools, but to talk about the ways that we can use tools to um, essentially bring our students into conversation about their own learning. And hybrid pedagogy launched into what we discovered early on was that we couldn't just be a static journal with um, articles that were reservoirs of expertise. What we needed to be doing was experimenting. So from the start, what we've been doing is running hybrid pedagogy as though it were a laboratory, a laboratory where everything that we do is an experiment in pedagogy. And a lot of these experiments are things that we didn't necessarily know what to expect from them. We ran them like good experiments. We had a hypothesis and things happened. And then we thought about those things, talked about those things, and engaged with both learners and teachers about, about the things that we were discovering as we did these things. So, for example, we ran MOOC MOOC, um, which was a MOOC about MOOCs, and an investigation of the MOOC form. We did that in uh, middle of 2012. And then we experimented. Another one of our experiments was called Digirimo, which was Digital Writing Month. Basically, we, we spent a month investigating what digital writing was, what happens to writing when we move it online. Twitter versus Zombies emerged out of Digital Writing Month. It was essentially an experiment of having us think about how this work that we do on Twitter. What I discovered during Digital Writing Month is that I produce more than a novel's worth of content in any given month, just in my emails, just in my Twitter feed, I write more than a novel's worth of content in a given month just on this sort of haphazard digital writing that I do. And Twitter versus Zombies was about how can we sort of playfully investigate the literary nature of Twitter and also the sort of nature of Twitter as a storytelling device. And so... That was the motivation, and Pete's going to tell you a little bit more about what the specific sort of parameters of the game were and how the game arose. Okay. Um, thanks, Jesse. The impetus for the game arose because we'd been um, asked to lead a presentation at Duke University last November on digital play, uh, digital pedagogy play and mass collaboration. And so to prepare for that presentation, we built – um, the game we ran the game for the weekend up until um, the week the weekend before our presentation at Duke on Monday, and then we had this vast archive worth of um, cool things to talk about in the presentation because the game ended right as the presentation began. So that was a fun experience. So what is Twitter versus Zombies? Um, this slide that you're looking at is um, asking you to remember this kind of playful experience that you have. Maybe if you have kids, you're doing this all the time already. Anyways, remember playing tag? Well, Twitter versus Zombies kind of takes the stakes um, for the idea of playing tag and makes them a little bit higher. Um, it um, it bumps the level of, um, of gameplay into a whole new level. And the idea for the game came from uh, or the root of the game comes from a game that's played on college campuses around the country called Humans vs. Zombies. It's a massive game of tag where one person begins as a zombie and hundreds of other people begin as humans. And then as the gameplay progresses through the week, people are tagging each other, turning each other into zombies, and then the zombies are trying to find the remaining humans. So we wanted to make um, a text social media adaptation of Humans vs. Zombies, and that's basically what Twitter vs. Zombies is. So let's look a little bit at the game mechanics and how the game works. Um, we ran the game for the first time um, last November, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, it's been we've run it one more time since then. So essentially, with Twitter vs. Zombies, um, we promoted it on um, on Twitter and through our blogs and through Hybrid Pedagogy, and we asked people to um, to register themselves into the game with very little kind of background or explanation for what it was. We opened up a editable Google uh, Google Docs spreadsheet, and we asked people to just include their name and their Twitter handle, and we fed all of those into a database that um, that, that kept track of everyone. All players began the game as a human, um, and then we had one Twitter presence, which acted as patient zero. And at the start of the game, which was, I think, 4 p.m. Um, on a Friday, patient zero showed up on Twitter using the TVSZ hashtag, um, and began uh, trying to find people on Twitter that were registered in the game and to bite them. So patient zero begins infecting people with the bite hashtag, and then all kinds of chaos ensues. So the game 
took place over three days. Um, and essentially, these were just the beginning rules, that if a zombie in the game uh, sent a tweet to you that included your name and the TVSZ hashtag and the hashtag bite, then you were, you were bitten. A zombie could only bite you after um, in, in a five-minute window from your last tweet. So um, none of this could happen while you were off Twitter. Um, in other words, while you were sleeping, you were safe. But once you logged into Twitter and once you started tweeting, you were fair game for any of the zombies. The zombies had um, uh, the restriction that they could only um, bite a human once every 30 minutes. And the humans were able to have two different kind of defenses. And these are the other two um, hashtag actions that were introduced in the game. Uh, the first was dodge, and the second was swipe. Um, and a human could send a, hash, could send a tweet back to a zombie that had bitten them with the dodge hashtag, that that, and that would neutralize the bite. Humans could also use the swipe hashtag to protect another human, a different human in the game that had been bitten. But again, these had restrictions. Human could only, a human could only um, use the dodge tag or the swipe tag once every hour. So essentially you've got zombies biting twice an hour and humans having um, a kind of defense that they could use um, twice during an hour. Um, but if no one, if you were bitten by a zombie in the game and, no, and you did not dodge or you could not dodge anymore and nobody swiped for you, five minutes from that tweet that where you were bitten, you were turned to a zombie. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how all of this unfolded. We can go to the next slide from there. Um, Jesse and I um, were madly building the game in the hours leading up to um, the launch of Twitter versus Zombies. And as we came out of one presentation on Friday afternoon, we were about an hour and a half from game launch, and suddenly all of the code for the game just disappeared or was corrupted in Jesse's computer. So what you're looking at right now is a picture of Jesse and I in the lobby of the hotel at, um, in Durham, North Carolina, just frantically trying to, um, to put the game back together. And we actually made it, I think, like two minutes or three minutes after start time. Yeah, I tweeted, um, I tweeted um, just before the game was, just as the game was launching, I said, well, the site isn't pretty. It'll be pretty in the next hour, but everything is there. Um, one of the things that I, I, I want to add about that is that a lot of the events that we've created, we've tried to make them as timely as possible. And in making them so timely, we've oftentimes been changing the game, making modifications to it right up to the last second. And it's less about a procrastination and more about making sure that what we're doing is feeding into a conversation that is happening right at that moment. So we have little interest in de designing a game um, a year before and then launching it a year later because then it will be sort of it will have already missed its moment and so this sort of furious scrambling was as much about because hey i had um, not saved uh, any of the work that i had done my computer crashed <laughs> uh, well that was part of it but then the other part of it was that we literally we work this way because we want there to be this kind of energy and we want there to kind of be this sort of of the moment of the things we're doing so if you're if, you're, yeah, if, if, if you guys are into, um Go Sorry, I'll jump in here. If you guys are finding this fascinating, I'm loving the, the story here. But you got questions for these guys. I encourage you, go to Twitter and use hash GE4L or submit your questions for them in your control panel. Carry on, guys. Thanks. Um, so it's a, good, it's a good time now, now that we have kind of the basic, of basic mechanics of the game explained, to kind of go into, um, to understand the game a little bit more deeply by looking at the design principles that we distilled out of the experience of running the game the first time. So the next couple of slides that you're going to see us talk through will have to do with the things that we learned about building a game like Twitter versus Zombies. And the first one is improvisation. Um, it was really important for us that, uh, that the game was essentially a platform for a community of people to build a narrative so that the story wasn't necessarily um, uh, living inside of the game, but that the game gave a kind of architecture that the players could fill with all kinds of narrative. Um, and what you're getting ready to see here are some examples. So um, essentially we did not um, want to dictate how people could build the tweets that would take place in the game. The only real rules that we that we gave players was that um, were that they had to use the TVSC hashtag, um, and if they were using an action, that they included the hashtag action inside the tweet. 
But within the first, even within the first hour of the game, players began to really kind of adapt and work over their their tweets. And so you have an example, two examples here of tweets from right at the beginning of the game, where um, Josh is uh, writing a poem. Uh, woke up this morning, found out I was dead, got bit by a zombie, and now I bite your head. That was a that was a tweet he used to bite somebody else inside of the game. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, also underneath Josh's tweet, you see the beginning of this narrative starting to form where Tatiana is talking about being huddled in the bushes um, and she's, and she's biting another human in the game. And the fascinating thing about this narrative piece was that we saw people playing off of small little stories that other characters or other players in the game had started hours before. So people were going back and reading the transcript of the whole game and then bringing things back in a couple of hours later to kind of add on to the kind of story that someone else has started. Um, on the right side of the screen, you also see an example of what um, of Michael Widner, um, and he, he by far had the best example here, but lots of people began changing their Twitter profile pictures when they were, cha- when they were turned from a human to a zombie. So you see here his very professional-looking uh, Stanford University um, Twitter profile when the game began. And pretty quickly after he was turned, he changed this um, this uh, creepy, scary profile that he maintained throughout the game and then changed back. It created a lot of discussion between people playing the game, a lot of whom were academics, that they wondered how many people were going to stop following them over the weekend because of all the tweets that were coming out from the game. Um, so we liked to see this kind of improvisation. Um, and I think Jesse maybe can tell us a little bit about the, the – the nature of the crowdsourced rules that we saw spring up during the game. Yeah. Um, what we noticed is that, and we had planned on the game being emergent from the beginning. We knew that these first three rules, what we wanted was a super simple architecture that anyone could understand at a glance. That essentially we could explain the, the basic rules of the game on a single, it's, it's in the sidebar on the page for the site. And all of the rules you need to play are right there in the sidebar. And we wanted it to be so simple so that this kind of these emergence rules would riff off of those basic rules. And so what we did is we just had people in discussion, both on Google Docs and in the Twitter feed itself, in discussion about the rules. What we noticed is actually we ended up having a lot of people have this discussion in the Google Docs because they didn't want to be tweeting too often because they were sort of huddling. The humans had a really interesting dynamic as the game changed that they literally were kind of huddling and they couldn't tweet anymore. So the humans started to say, well, I don't want to never be on Twitter anymore, so I have to figure out a way to be able to be on Twitter. So this game, I'm not going to talk about all of these crowdsourced rules, but the rules, the safe zone rule really emerged out of this idea that, hey, I've got to get work done on Twitter. And so we've got to have some sort of rule that will allow me to be on Twitter without getting bit left and right. Um, And so the safe zone rule basically said, hey, if you write a blog post, and you put it out on the T versus Z hashtag, you write a blog post about the game or about some aspect of the game, put it out on the hashtag, you get a safe zone. And I think it lasted for an hour. We put, we sort of tweaked the rules of the game based uh, during the game itself to sort of um, you know get the balance to be right so that the humans weren't overpowered or the zombies weren't overpowered. But the gist is what happened is all of these rules started to produce this amazing amount of stuff, really cool um, blog posts, pictures that people were taking and what people were learning as they were doing this was some of these players, you know, they had to tweet to save their life. You know, they had to take a picture and upload it to Twitter in order to save their life. So there's this way in which it took these sort of basic Twitter literacy activities, um, using a hashtag, uploading a picture, um, doing an at mention, these basic activities, and gave them this um, this sort of drama and this sort of you felt like you had to learn them in order to survive. Also, the other, the other thing that we found that was really um, encouraging when we were looking at the rules document, we told everyone when we started the game that every 12 hours we were going to do um, some, some kind of tweak to the game. We were going to adapt it in some way and that we wanted to respond to their um, their ideas about that. So what you're seeing on the screen here are the, the, the wording of the rules that we hammered out in this Google document. <clears throat> but 
before the rule would be released, there would be, like Jesse said, this kind of long conversation about what kind of rule would really be good. And the zombies and the humans would be potentially talking back and forth to each other on the Google document and asking us to consider this rule or that rule. So that when the rules were released, the community did feel like they'd built them themselves. <clears throat> um, I think another, we can probably move to the next um, slide, Daryl, and we're going to see examples of um, the kinds of artifacts that all of these rules generated. Um, these are the other, <clears throat> these are the um, two of the other design principles that we felt like were really important in building the game. One was self-legislation and one was engagement. We had a game, you know, within a couple of hours, really within the first hour, we had a game that had over 100 people participating, spread out over at least four different countries across multiple time zones. And we knew that we could not sit in the role of a referee for this game because it was happening all the time. It was happening really 24 hours a day. So um, a lot of the wording that we put into um, the early game document um, put the responsibility for legislating the game on the people themselves so that um, so that a, a zombie that bit a human or a human that tried to defend him or herself against a bite would be able to have a discussion about whether enough time had gone by, whether the human had been turned. And the ultimate arbiter of that was really the time stamp on the tweet. We hadn't really foreseen that, but the, the fact the tweets are very um, precisely time stamped made it very easy to say, well, here's the bite tweet, and here's the tweet where you tried to defend yourself. There's just more than five minutes between those. You, you've been turned. But it actually was a surprisingly few number of cases that we had to step in and do any of that legislation. And when and when it happened, it was because the community had kicked the question to us. They'd said, we've had a question about this, and we, we can't decide how the game should proceed. But ultimately, we often, go ahead. When we, and when we got those, we often turned it back on them to basically say, you know, if it was, if it seemed like it was a decision we could easily make, we'd make it. But we often turned it back on them and said, well, here's the rules. You need to decide what should happen in this situation and then make a ruling. Um, and a, another thing that, that I'll add to this is that, I mean, really this comes out of how we create, how both Pete and I create our classrooms. That our classrooms are, and that's what's important. It's not as much, this game wasn't for the sake of just having fun on Twitter. That was, that was a huge part of it. But there was also a way in which this game was modeling what we and what a lot of the participants do in their classrooms, this idea of self-legislation. This is something that I do in all of my classrooms where I ask my students to help govern what goes on in the classroom and help them govern the sort of um, assessment practices, the objectives of the course, the even the reading list, the syllabus, all of these things become co-authored documents that I write with my students. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and we were able to um, really, uh, we became very encouraged by the, the fact that the people playing the game kind of understood that concept as soon as we explained it and felt comfortable um, sitting in that role. It, it, it felt very much like within a couple of hours of the game, it felt very much like we were not essentially any different from anyone else in the game, and the game was basically running itself because the community had kind of taken responsibility for it. Um, the engagement piece here is something, um, and I'm glad, Jesse, that you made that point about the connection between the game and our pedagogy. The engagement component um, really asked uh, players in the game, just like we're asking students, to take on, um, to assume a kind of... Um, a rigorous level of engagement um, because really the game, you got as much out of Twitter versus zombies as you put into it. So if you kind of sat and watched the hashtag and didn't, didn't really tweet or participate, you probably did enjoy some of the banter that went back and forth. But the minute that you jumped in um, and started talking with somebody else inside of the game, or even if you were just tweeting for work and somebody popped up out of nowhere and bit you, um, you immediately, if you were taking the game, kind of seriously, you immediately were engaged. You had to take a picture of something that would defend you, or you had to do a little bit of blogging to, um, to carve out a safe space. And um, as individual artifacts, those things were interesting, 
but the amount of them that piled up and that we were able to review at the end of the game um, was fantastic. And it really um, kind of made this point that um, that when you turn when you turn engagement back on students, when you ask them to create content for the class or for a discussion or for any kind of assessment that you're going to build, that um, that doesn't mean that one person or two people have to run with it. It means that um, a kind of a kind of common average of engagement means that you um, that you have tons of um, useful artifacts, useful text to work with. Um, and we saw, and you'll have a link at the end of the presentation to see some of this stuff. But um, we were really impressed with how quickly people in the game picked up on this concept and um, and began. Uh, creating things that kept the game going, and it was because they had buy-in to the um, to the ultimate result of the game. I think. I think next slide, maybe Jesse, if you um, if you want to talk about this as a as a safe zone, we've got a slide that's an example of a blog post that somebody wrote, um, Kevin Hodgson, while he was playing the game. And before you do that, I just want to jump in here and remind people that they can submit their questions using the GE4L hashtag. Uh, as well as using the question function. And we have many questions coming in, so throw them in and we get a chance, we'll ask your questions. Carry on, guys. Yeah, and I actually am going to just sort of speed through this in the next slide, um, and then I can so, so we can open it up for discussion a little bit, just to say that what was fascinating to me was the sheer amount of stuff that this game produced, the amount of blog posts, the amount of sort of, the, the sort of emergent creative activity that came off of this game, I thought was marvelous. I had never seen a group of really creative, intelligent people produce so much in so short a time. So not only were there blog posts, but I think that the next slide is going to show um, photographs that people were taking um, in order to, yeah, I, so in order to have a weapon, you had to actually take a picture of a device that would function as a weapon. And so this is one of them. And I think the next slide shows you a half dozen more weapons. Um, that were produced and that were shared on that, and sort of some of the real creativity that people had, because not only did they um, produce this weapon, but they would also, within their tweets, talk about how this weapon served its function. So, for example, Audrey Waters, the cup of coffee there, she, I, I think it was, yeah, I bit her in the morning, and she tossed her cup of morning coffee at me. And it was, I mean, it was just such a nice, moment, like I'm just going to, it's a weapon of opportunity. I'm going to take a picture of something in my environment, and then I have to create a narrative about how this um, weapon, how this sort of item of opportunity can become a weapon in the, the zombie onslaught. I want to um, take a, a detour just for a quick minute um, before we introduce this video with Becca. Um, it looks like Sam has a question on um, Twitter, and maybe we should have made this more clear beforehand, but Jesse, I think it's good for us to talk about. He's asking, what's the pedagogical objective of the game? Um, <clears throat> I would say that there were several, um, but one of them is um, there's lots of discussion about um, digital literacies that, that lots of us are participating in in the last three or four years. Um, and most of that discussion kind of has to happen in isolation unless you're actually building new media artifacts or unless you're actually um, with a class inside of a social network and showing off how useful it is for collaborating on a piece of writing or sharing resources across a, a collaborative bibliography or something like that. So we wanted to teach people how Twitter was useful for sharing and publishing information like blog posts or pictures or in creating a story um, in in a live kind of environment instead of having it be um, instead of Twitter being the content of a course Twitter became kind of like this sandbox where all of us could kind of just work it out and practice um, the use of something like a hashtag the use of something like um, or the synergy that happens between publishing something on a blog, which potentially not tons of people will see, and publishing that blog post on Twitter, linking it with a hashtag to a larger conversation that's going on, and then watching um, the community respond to that. So the first answer I would give to that question is, um, for me, that it was an attempt to um, to introduce an aspect of uh, or, or a number of aspects of digital literacies into a community and watch them um, 
practice them in kind of an adventurous, fun way rather than just working through a bunch of steps. And the thing for me, I mean, one of the really important things for me was helping people learn how to build community online. And one of the things that the game required is it really required you to rely on each other and in many cases rely on people that you had only just met within the context of the game. So you had to make these very quick relationships and then you had to be doing things like trusting each other, helping each other, but then also arbitrating rules with each other. I mean, these are sort of high order kinds of interactions. I mean, arbitrating a rule, self-legislating, crowdsourcing. I mean, these are complex behaviors that you, for someone to be able to do those things with people that they've only just met sometimes hours before is, I think it's a very complex skill. And so this sort of idea of taking social networking and not just having it being about building a follower list, but having it be about collaborating people with people in this online environment to reach, meet, sort of meet these real goals. Um, it's probably worth, um, worth stepping back from a couple of things that you've already seen and provide some kind of setup for, um, for the video link that you have here. And I think that, um, I think that rather than play it inside the window of the webinar, we're just going to leave the link for you to look at, you know, either now while we're talking or on your own time afterwards. But um, essentially what we saw happen as people were um, posting pictures that prevented them from being turned to a zombie or on the, on the other side, posting um, pictures or blog posts that allowed the zombies to attack more than they would normally be able to, um, we saw this kind of collection, like we've gestured to a couple of times before, of artifacts that told the story of the game. Um, and probably the best example of a situation that we actually had to, um, well, we actually didn't legislate this at all, but um, raised a real question of, of community ethics was um, is evidenced by this video that we have in the slide. Um, Becca Hogue at the time was a student of mine in, um, in a history of argument class at Georgia State. And um, like several people in the game, we're just kind of smitten with it and, and um, spent a lot of the weekend playing it. And Becca kind of achieved the celebrity of being somebody who was really good at remaining a human, which was hard to do inside of the game. Um, when, we, <clears throat> when we introduced the safe zone rule, Becca and lots of the other humans in the game were writing blog posts in order to prevent themselves from being bitten, and it would give them basically like an hour of free space to interact with other people in the game, including zombies, and not get bitten. So we learned as we woke up one morning um, that there had been a glitch in one of Becca's tweets where she posted her safe zone, and um, that she had posted the wrong link inside the tweet, but she had meant to link to her safe zone blog post, but she had linked to something else. Um, and we actually ended up having to get on the phone with Becca and talk to her um, because so much kind of was riding inside the game with other players um, on Becca staying human. Uh, eventually, though, and this, this was just an ethical decision on her part, Becca decided that um, because the, the tweet was improperly built, that as hard as she was trying to stay, stay a human in the game, that she really, for the purposes of the game and the community, needed to turn. Um, and so she posted, and we hadn't brought up the idea of making videos yet, but she posted this video as kind of her um, her last goodbye to the human community. Um, and it's, re it's really an interesting, funny, kind of touching thing to watch because she's kind of chewing over the, the, uh, the difficulty of making that decision. Um, and her reluctance to become a zombie um, really resonated with other people that had become zombies and affected the outcome of the game, which happened, you know, tw tw maybe 12 or 24 hours after this. So I would encourage anybody who wants to get kind of the human side of, of the first game to watch this video. Videos became an important part of the second iteration of the game, but this was one of the only ones that I can remember posted from the first version in November. And Jesse, do you want to talk about our um, reflection document that we looked at? at the I end? sort of think, I mean, that, that link is there. I mean, some of this l later stuff in our slide, I think we should just leave as a, a, a reference, a resource for people. We mm -hmm. also have written this article that we've shared the link out on the hashtag. And also there is a, within the 
within the article on my blog at jessestommel.com, there is a link to a Storify that has basically an archive of, all, of curated materials from the first iteration of the game. And so what we're looking at appearing on the screen right now is we had a basically an eight-page, something like thousand words were written in a crowdsourced reflection document with people just talking about the game and responding to the game during the course of, of the game. And we did this over a couple hours right at the end of the game. We produced this really kind of massive document, and here's some quotes from that. Um, but what I'd really love to hear is I'd love to jump into some of these questions that we're getting on the um, Twitter feed. And we're getting lots of questions, let me tell you that. So to remind everybody, you know, if you haven't put your questions in yet, you can definitely do that by just referencing the hashtag you see in the bottom of your screen, hash, G-E-4-L. Or you could also use the question function in the control panel of GoToWebinar on your screen. So I don't know where to start, guys. Let me see if I pick one up here randomly. Um, could all ages play this? What was one of the questions? Yeah, I responded to that question on Twitter. Um, I think that that obviously with anything that's open, like a platform like Twitter, um, you have to be careful, and especially with the content here, um, there really were some kinds of graphic gruesomeness that would happen, although most of it really stayed tongue-in-cheek, and nobody nobody really went over the top. When we played the second version of the game, um, after I'd seen it once before, um, I encouraged both my um, teenagers, my 13- and my 14-year-old, to play, and both of them did. Um, so, yes... We opened it up to, um, we didn't put any age restrictions on it. I believe Twitter has an age restriction that's maybe similar to Facebook. So um, so I wouldn't encourage anybody to get on and play who is younger than like 12 or 13, which I think may be the Twitter floor for, um, for participation. Um, but especially with the community that we kind of collected for this thing, it was clear that people were being... Um, nice to each other and we're aware kind of of the level of um, the, the age level and also I think the level of technical savvy that other people had. Um, I know that when my daughter jumped into the game, because other people knew she was my daughter, they were really invested in taking care of her and trying to prevent her from getting bitten. <laughs> so she had preferential well, treatment. Think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were protecting our family. But I mean, that's, part of, that's sort of part of the game. That's part of how you collaborate online is you rely on networks that in some cases you've built offline. I know that I, for example, um, I think at one point asked my dad to protect me, and he never uses Twitter. He happened to already have an account, so he didn't have to build an account. So I real quick call him up and say, can you jump on Twitter, and can you, you know, write, here's what I need you to write in a tweet. And, you know, so I've got my dad saving my life. Um, but one thing I really loved about the game, and this is sort of an offshoot of this question, is the way that it brought um, teachers and their students into a game space together, which was an egalitarian space, where you can essentially couldn't tell the difference between who was a student in the game and who was a teacher in the game. And this is a really kind of marvelous thing. I mean, again, this is how I try to run my classroom. I, I pride myself on running a classroom where an outsider would come into the room and say, who's the teacher here? Um, and that was sort of what we experienced with this game, was that people were really working together and those kind of student-teacher, um, that kind of student-teacher binary wasn't in place. One of the questions, you talk about the classroom, one of the questions here was, was Twitter used for communal discussion about the class, or was that done during class time? Hmm. Um, this actually, the first version of the game was not connected formally to any class that Jesse or I um, were teaching. Um, our students, just because we love them and we <laughs> do all kinds of things um, with them outside of class, some of my students and his students registered into that first game. Um, however, the second game, um, which which is kind of a slide that we maybe could jump back to in a second, the second version of the game was a collaborative project between myself and Janine DeBase, who's um, one of our close kind of writing colleagues up in New York. And in December, after the game ran, Janine and I had a long conversation about turning the game um, over to a group of students if they were interested in letting them run the game and letting them talk about all these questions about the design element and the legislation and the narrative. Um, and so that happened, and um, it was more encouraged in that second game 
that students um, from my class and from her class participated in the construction of the game or the playing of the game. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't mandated in either situation either that they had students in my class had a project that they could work on or they could they could be involved in Twitter versus zombies and that only took up about three or four days of class with the exception of the students that really burrowed down um, into the construction of the game. Daryl, if we could go back to that one slide, absolutely, um, that would be um, useful. I know that at least one of these um, one of these. Uh, students is watching along the hashtag because I've seen her tweet a little bit, Jen. Um, but these are two students, Jen and Andrew from my class, and two students, um, Gavin and Pierce from Janine's class. And these four, and maybe a, uh, also an ancillary group of five or six students around them, generated all of the content for the game. They built a website. They um, they monitored the uh, the spreadsheet that it used to collect uh, people's names. They came up with, they had a rules committee, and they were constantly kind of having discussions about new rules that they could ro roll out through the game. So their game ran just like ours for three days. Um, it was a completely different kind of game. It had different rules. It had a different community. Um, but we did use Twitter afterwards in that class to discuss back and forth how, um, how the game went. And even beyond Twitter versus Zombies, Twitter has become a pretty – um, ubiquitous teaching platform for me, um, especially in the class that these students were in, which is electronic writing and publishing. So we use Twitter a lot to collect sources for the publication that we compose. We use it to um, to coordinate um, kind of acts of amateur journalism when we're writing um, together. So I would say, yeah, um, the, Twitter is a useful place to discuss all of this um, all this activity, but it was never a mandated function of the class, the game. There's a lot of comments online on Twitter and the question about using this as an icebreaker or some way to maybe kickstart a class. Any any thoughts on that? I think I, I was lo looking at that question and thinking about that, and I certainly think, dependent with the right topic, I mean, certainly a class that's about literacy, I tend to like icebreakers that aren't just merely for the sake of building community, but that actually build a community around the subject that the class is then going to explore. Um, and so I think that in the for the right class, but the other thing I'll say is that I really see how the game could be adapted to... Um, to sort of reach different kinds of goals because you can create in-game actions that require different sorts of things. So if your course is a, a coding class, for example, maybe in order to use the weapon tag, you have to create a bit of code that can be run and produce, you know, produce some effect. Um, so there's ways in which the game can be hacked so that it almost meets any learning objective. And when we created the game, we really wanted to create, again, I'm going to use this idea of a portable, a sort of portable shell, something that could be taken and riffed on by any sort of community, um, a game that could be really hacked and forked to, be, to sort of be made to do whatever you need to do it in a particular community. Just reminding... And I also think... Oh, go ahead. I'm no, no, sorry. go ahead, by all means. I was going to say it's also um, something like Twitter versus Zombies um, would would work similarly, only under a different narrative. Um, I've experimented in um, trainings that I've done with other teachers and also in classes that using Twitter as a, a kind of scavenger hunt tool, um, it, especially to get students who haven't met each other kind of um, kind of off the couch metaphorically and, and engaged with each other, um, is great. Uh, is a great is a great way to to show how digital literacy doesn't require someone to be sitting at a computer all the time, because being able to go out around a college campus um, or a campus at all and take pictures of things. For example, I did a training with um, with a bunch of teachers who were who were preparing to teach their first hybrid class, and they hadn't used Twitter before. And I sent them out to take pictures of something that they could call a piece of educational technology. Um, and the the responses that we got using this similar hashtag were really interesting and thought provoking. Like somebody took a picture of a coffee maker and they said, "This is a really important piece of um, of educational technology." Somebody took a picture of a thermostat, um, but also things like um, you know 
classroom computers or or clickers. Um, and it really was a good way to get everyone using the platform, walking around, looking for things, and commenting back and forth on each other's on each other's uh, pictures. So scavenger hunts, um, Twitter versus zombies, and um, icebreakers, I think, all kind of share a common engagement intention. Just want to do a little plug here while you get, continue to get more questions, and you can submit those in the question of the control panel or using hash GE4L on Twitter. Uh, you're listening to Jesse Stommel and Pete Rorabaugh, and you can follow them on Twitter with the information you see on your screen, at Jessifer for Jesse and at All is Telling for Pete. What's also interesting to note is that they are both the co-founders of Hybrid Pedagogy, a digital learning a journal of learning, teaching, and technology, and you can find that website at Hybrid pedagogy.com so check that out to learn more about these people give them a follow here's a quick little question for you they want to know what if any negative feedback did you receive in this process hmm. well i think I, I maybe what i will say this isn't as much negative feedback as it was maybe a, a, an example of skepticism about the the game but one of the skeptics skepticisms that we faced was the sort of idea, well, what were the outcomes? What was the goal? What were you trying to teach? And one of the things that I'll say about that, I think it's a really important question to ask, but I tend to not think that's the right question to ask at the outset of a learning experience. For me, outcomes are emergent. There's something you discover in the learning activity. You can't outline the outcomes and then orchestrate an event, at least not one that is massive or connectivist in the nature that um, Twitter versus zombies was. You really have to rely on the community to build those outcomes during the event itself. Um, so that was one of the, as I say, skepticisms. Pete, do you have any other thoughts? Um, I do. I think that um, what we've learned in our in our experiments with Mook Mook, with um, Jesse and Sean, um, with Digirimo and Jesse and Jesse and myself with Twitter versus Zombies is that there's so much cleanup. Um, there's so much you, you feel so much of a responsibility when something like this is over to collect all of this, all of the pieces, all of the artifacts and the relationships and the publishing um, pieces and make something out of it. Um, and that for us so far has been really challenging. Um, I think that. Um, I think that we tried for the with the first game to fold a lot of that responsibility back on the community, and they really did a lot of curating of the material that was useful. Uh, but the second game um, that we ran with the stu that I ran with the students and Janine just really got away from us. There was so it was in the middle of the semester, and there was so many other things happening that when the game was finished, we just kind of all breathed this collective sigh of relief and exhaustion because <laughs> you you don't think that you can spend a lot of time on Twitter until until something like this <laughs> happens. Um, but all of those pieces are um, challenging, and it takes a real kind of focus going into something like this to um, to put all of those pieces together in some meaningful way. After it, we're still, in fact, assembling observations and um, and takeaways from the game just from last year. So. Um, that is a potential downside is that it generates a bunch of work um, that if you're if you're the kind of student of digital literacy that that we try to be, um, you can get kind of overwhelmed. And you feel, I don't know, I feel responsible. Like I feel responsible right. to like curation is a real responsibility for me. Like to feel like important stuff shouldn't just get lost in the flood of digital uh, material that's crossing our path. And so there's a way in which, for me, I feel like I ha like it's my duty to collect things and to curate them. And the Storify, for example, from the first Twitter versus Zombies, which is um, which we just published online, is only a small fraction of what was actually produced during the course of the game. I was trying to create a representative, a representative sample, but there's a way in which there's just too much. And you can't just create an archive with everything listed there because then that's just a big pile of stuff and there's no right. sort of through line. So it's not only collecting the stuff that's created, but also creating some kind of through line for the experience so someone that comes across it 10 years later can actually make sense of what all this stuff even is. Yeah, exactly. 
So I would say I would add to that also, and I, I'm not sure how much discussion you guys have been able to have about this in game elements so far, but um, but this is something that we see as a blessing and, and potentially an obstacle as well in um, in connectivist MOOC um, communities where you know the course in in the best sense of the word um, in a connectivist MOOC just gets away from you. There's so much. Um, there's so much relationship that happens outside of the of the hub of the class, even if there is really a hub, um, that it it really does um, transfer uh, a lot of responsibility um, and authority onto the learner to make what they can out of that experience. And so you see, out of connectivist MOOCs like <clears throat> like Change Eleven and like ET MOOC that maybe some of the people on this course participated in back in the back in the winter time that Alec Koros organized, um, just a massive, massive amount of writing and uploading of pictures and videos and commenting back and forth, and there's just no way to wrap um, one linear net around all of that stuff. Everybody in a large connectivist MOOC ends up taking away. Uh, different things from the experience, and so it, it it lands the responsibility lands on those people to um, to to do that. I, actually, it's funny as I'm saying that I'm seeing that Katie, who was a, um, a student of mine in the spring and participated in the game, just posted um, a storify that she made from all of her experiences in the game, and I'm almost certain. When I pull this thing up, that I'm going to see it, and it's going to look very different from anything that I made. So um, anybody can check out that tweet. Um, well, and one thing that we did with, within the game is we actually had making Storifies um, one of the things that you could do to get an in-game action. So there's a way in which we don't, even though we feel really responsible to curate all this digital material that's created, we then also asked the other participants in the game to do the same thing. We basically said, if you make a Storify of your experience in the game, then you can use that as an in-game action. And it was it was a way to basically say, there's too much here for us to ever process. For us, the game makers, but also for any player in the game, too much information for them to process. And so we need these sort of biteable bits. And so having, having players making these themselves at the end really helped with that. Uh, other questions? That you yeah, we'll, we've got time for one more question, then we'll wrap it up so people can get on with their day. Um, and so if we don't get to your question, I apologize, but the conversation will continue on Twitter. How's that? Uh, simple question here. What was your biggest shock, biggest surprise? The, you didn't see it coming. It happened. It developed. Whatever it might be, what was the one you didn't see? For me, it was how much time I put into this game. <laughs> um, and I think this is true for Pete as well. It was literally every waking hour we worked on this game. And we did it between two presentations. As you said at the beginning, we did a presentation at the uh, South Atlantic Modern Language Association, and then we did a presentation at Duke. And the game took place literally from the moment that our first presentation ended until the moment that our Duke presentation began. The game was literally ending just as we started talking at Duke. And we were working on the game every waking hour between then, and we didn't get eight hours of sleep. And literally, I was in my hotel room, and Pete was on the bed, uh, you know, on the other bed, and we were working into the wee hours of the night on this thing. And we'd go walk to have a meal, and we'd be talking about the game the entire time yeah. that we were walking. So it was it's literally. Absolutely it's absolutely true that that um, over that co the course of that weekend, we would wake up, and the first thing that we would do would be to get on the hashtag and see what happened while we were asleep, because there were people in the UK or people in Korea that were playing. Um, and people who were being turned in the middle of the night uh, because they were up on Twitter playing, uh, it was amazing. Um, and we didn't put 16-hour days into it because it was work. I mean, we put it in because we were also caught up in the game, and I think that the best learning experiences, as a teacher, the best learning experiences that I create are the ones my students get caught up in, but also the ones that I just get caught up in because I want to play with them. Well, it sounds like a blast. Yeah, and I'll also add to that. I'll also add to that that um, that that organizing or leading an experience like this, if you're imagining, I see lots of people are imagining new adaptations, and um, I really like the couple that Kathy um, uh, Musky just put up there about um, about looking for antidotes or changing it into some kind of mercenary game. Um, that 
that if you decide to take on some kind of a project like this, whether it's a large scale or small scale project, it's not it's not absolutely necessary that you spend every waking hour on it. I know that the students that I worked with for the with for Twitter versus Zombies 2.0 in February, they worked very hard on it, but they certainly were not around the clock on Twitter like we were the first time. It's doable with the right amount of um, with the right amount of preparation of the players. It's doable that this game can, you know, in, in a lot of ways, run itself. And one of the pressures for Pete and I was that we were going to be giving a presentation about the game. The game right. was, in a lot of ways, a, um, a laboratory for the presentation that we were going to give at the end of the game. So we were not only running a game, but we were also doing this meta-level thinking about the game and thinking about what the game was and you know, ph- philosophizing the game. And I don't think that you don't have to do that in the moment the way that we were doing. Right. Twitter versus Zombies. You heard it here from Jesse Stommel, Pete Rorba. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. If you, be, um, yeah, Daryl, if I could jump in and say one more thing before we close. Um, I've just been wrapping up um, a conversation before we started with uh, Brendan Murphy, who runs a um, – he does um, teacher development at a public school system, I think somewhere in the – in the Midwest, but he and I have had discussions um, about leading another game in September. So for anybody who's interested in watching this happen, if you just kind of regularly check in on the TBSC hashtag, you'll start to see us promoted. It will probably happen within the first two weeks of September. And so whenever something like that runs, anyone, anyone can jump in. So if you're interested in getting into a game that's already running, you can look for one in September. There you go. Well, you're getting lots of thank yous coming in online here, folks, on Twitter and on the uh, control panel. Go to webinar. We've had fun. If you liked what you're seeing here, folks, you want to continue in the conversation, as you just heard, fo- make sure you continue to follow the hash TBSZ. Uh, as well, you can check out the hybridpedagogy.com website that these two fine gentlemen have co-founded. And by all means, follow them at Jessifer at All Is Telling. We've had a great time today, folks. We're glad you joined us for this exciting discussion. Gentlemen, Thanks for your time. Everybody, have a fantastic day. Take care.